Chick-fil-A goes virtual, tacos on subscription, and alcohol delivery extended to 2026 in California. That's all ahead on this week's Monday Minute. It's been a busy news week, and we have five key topics to share. We're each going to ask the other a question. Are you ready? Let's go. I have the first question this week, Meredith. Uh, Chick-fil-A have announced that they are now in the virtual world. What are they doing and why is it right for them? So the company is operating through something called Little Blue Plate, um, which represents the the very first restaurant. And uh, so far they have three uh, brands that they're offering through that. One is Flock and Farm, Garden Day, and Outfox Wings. So I think, you know, they'll experiment with these two and in true Chick-fil-A fashion, they'll do a a limited small, these three, sorry, limited small version in two locations, see how it goes, see what they learn, and then figure out how to roll it nationally. I'm super excited to see what happens with these. Um, Chick-fil-A is a great company for listening to their consumer, getting feedback and integrating it into the product. So question for you, Sainsbury's. Um, who's you know probably near and dear to your heart has launched eco-friendly packaging. Um, so talk a little bit about that and how you think it might apply to restaurant delivery here in the U.S. Yeah, Sainsbury's is I think the second largest grocer in the U.K. and they have been working on this for a while, uh, working with a company called Greencore that supports the development of sandwiches and sandwich packaging over in the U.K. And alongside another grocer, they announced this week that they're having a paper-based kind of plastic covering over the front of their sandwiches, except there's no plastic at all. And you look at that, and let me just show you a picture of it. I'll bring it up here so you can see. That looks pretty much like a typical plastic covering, doesn't it? And it's <laughs> it's actually the same kind of shelf life. It doesn't compromise the quality of the product. Yeah. But of course, it is completely addressing the green agenda. Now, you and I spend a lot of our time talking about the improvements of packaging for takeaway and for delivered food, largely from the standpoint of function, as in making sure the food quality and integrity is maintained. We also spend time talking about the importance of it as a marketing tool in helping customers be able to learn about first party platforms. But as we cover in our book on the maturity of markets chapter, the UK and the UK consumer is a bit more advanced perhaps in their experiences of off-premise food. And I think their attention now is turning more towards greener initiatives and how they can eat delivery but in a more kind of green context. In fact, another interesting headline that I saw this week was about Just Eat uh, and Club Zero. They've got their customers now to opt in to reusable packaging, and then the customer can actually uh, have that packaging collected via an app or drop it off at a designated point. So I think um, we'll see more of this, and there are certainly local players doing this. We focus on a few in our book. Uh, But the green agenda does have a role to play with packaging, and it's great to see someone as big as Sainsbury's in the UK take some steps towards it. Okay, the third question we have this week is from a grocery uh, dive. We uh, we saw a a feature, if you recall, about an Australian-based software called Foodstorm. Um, They're talking about independent grocers bolstering their catering operation, particularly as the holiday season approaches. And I think what struck my mind about that was do restaurants have to be wary about grocers taking a bit of a stab at their catering operation? And is that a threat that restaurants need to take seriously? Yeah, well, look, uh, food away from home, which is a fancy way for saying restaurants, has outgrown food at home, which is a fancy way for saying grocery, for many years now, um, and in fact is now larger in America than food at home or grocery spend. Um, and you know, grocery stores are gonna look at that and figure out how to compete. And a lot of that over the last 10 years has been them uh, really focusing on what's called the edge of store, which is the more um, fresh oriented products. But that edge of store now has been evolving to include even more prepared and semi-prepared, ready to cook or ready to eat products. And as that evolution continues, you're going to see restaurants um, and grocery stores merge together a little bit, right? So with Whole Foods, we see them putting actual restaurants inside the grocery store. Uh, With Kroger, we recently saw the Kitchen United deal, putting a whole bunch of restaurants inside the grocery store. Um, With Walmart, who is actually a grocer, uh, putting Ghost Kitchen brands inside, um, testing that at a single location in Rochester. 
Uh, and I think this catering piece is just an extension of that, trying to figure out how to use all that food that they already have on site and the ki kitchen capacity that many grocery stores have um, to apply it to these kinds of occasions um, where historically, you know, maybe I might have cooked Thanksgiving dinner, but now why? There's so many great chefs out there doing so much great cooking, making things that I probably couldn't make. Uh, and being able to get it, whether at a restaurant or at a grocery store, is awesome. California for me. announced this week that restaurants can deliver alcohol until 2026. So I'm not sure if that's a sign that Californians like alcohol or that they believe the pandemic is going to go on for that long. But do you think this means restaurants should become bar delivery services too? <laughs> well, uh, we already know there are services out there that are definitely trying to play into this space. But for me, this is another example of how restaurants can just raise their average tray value. Um, also, we're talking about a category, of course, that has high margins. And in a low margin environment, that can't help. That can't do anything but help. The, um, there are restrictions in place, though. It's not like you're going to get completely uh, drunk on a, a delivery service. Uh, I believe you can only get two drinks delivered per meal. And so therefore, there are some sensible uh, precautions put in place. But to see um, the regulatory authorities now say this can stay in place until 2026. I think what this is really saying, Meredith, is that this is going to be the way it happens going forward. If California mm -hmm. starts in this way, other states I'm sure will follow. And I would encourage restaurants to, again, refer to, I think it's chapter eight in our book, where we, we talk about not just selling drink brands that are noticeable, you know, the, the Budweiser of this world, but actually thinking about proprietary beverages and to try and help uh, your guests really think about the way in which they personalize what they drink alongside what they eat. Mm -hmm. In that way, you're going to be able to, you know, go against perhaps the mentality of someone to say, well, I've already got a bottle of wine in the fridge. I've already got a few beers in the fridge. If you've got something proprietary, you're actually offering something special that the customer can't get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. This opportunity now um, with alcohol being able to be delivered up until 2026, certainly California restaurants uh, are going to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. So one more question. Uh, a company near and dear to your heart, Taco Bell, have launched a subscription service called the Taco Pass uh, this yeah. week. Um, is the subscription model something that we're going to see come into many restaurants in the future? Absolutely. I mean, this whole shift in restaurants is about bringing the restaurant industry toward e-commerce and all of the amazing things that e-commerce interactions have opened up um, first in things like apparel and CPG, but now in restaurants, right? And that includes things like micro niche brands, that includes the subscription economy. You're totally going to be seeing these things. And I um, I love the Taco Bell. I think it's a very cool idea. And yes, I am biased in favor of Taco Bell. Um, it's an interesting product design in that you can only get one taco a day. And, you know, having worked at and eaten at Taco Bell for many years, um, I can tell you that just one taco a day is not enough. So, um, you know, I think what they're trying to do there with the product design is encourage people to add other things to their basket um, and really grow their tray value there. But I don't know, it'll be interesting to see if that acts as a deterrent to actually um, picking up on the subscription because what's in it for the consumer if, if their tacos are limited, right? Um, Taco Bell is also not the first brand to do this. We had um, Panera come out with their unlimited coffee program um, in early 2020. By October, they said they had half a million people signed up um, subscribing to it. It was $9 a month and they've reported that it's uh, increased food attachment and customer acquisition. Uh, so I think you can see this is definitely going to be a thing in the restaurant industry. All right, everyone. Look, thank you as always for joining us. We'd love to hear from you. Please, as always, leave your comments. Any questions that you have for us in the area below, uh, the links are also down there so you can check out the articles we've been referring to. But as ever, thank you for your time and we look forward to speaking to you again next week. Bye.